Hey everyone, my name is Travis and I have the pleasure today of teaching. Uh, Pastor Chris asked me to do that as you are all in your family discipleship and life in rhythm series. And he asked me to teach today on family values, which is something that's near and dear to my heart. And you'll hear about why that is, but what an opportunity that in today's day and age that we can gather together, not just in person, but also online, and that the gospel and the word of God gets to be preached. Would you pray with me wherever you're at uh, before we get started today? Thank you, Jesus, so much for the opportunity to teach your word. I pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us, that you would instruct us, that you would give us uh, the words to, to hear from you of the areas in our lives of how you would like us to respond and to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, our topic today is on family values and how do you craft those and what should those look like in our homes and in our relationships. Now, for me and my family, a uh, picture of them here on the screen, we, my wife and I, have been married for, uh, it'll be 23 years beginning this June. Now, a lot of people don't believe that, that those are our kids <laughs> because we look so young. We got married at age 20, and our oldest is 21, our middle, there is 19 and our baby girl is about to turn 17. And I can tell you that being a parent and raising kids has been one of the greatest joys of our life, but it's also been one of the most challenging things, especially when it comes to figuring out what type of parent, what type of home, and what type of young adults we're going to raise and release and launch someday. That's been kind of a challenge. One of the biggest things that we've learned through that whole process, and, and you'll hear some of our story throughout today, is number one, that you get to choose the godly values that define your family. We all have a choice in that. You can choose those values and they get to define how that family looks, how your relationships go together with people, and how you impact the world around you. But one of the key questions that we have to ask ourselves as followers of Jesus is what are the biblical values that should characterize our families and the lives that we live out. How do we know what those are? You know, the dictionary defines values as a noun, and it means a person's principles or standards of behavior, one's judgment of what's important in life. Values really then are the tone that we set, the convictions that we stand on, and the principles we live out. They're the culture that we're creating. And for many of us, we can either create that culture by default, just haphazardly, or we can do it very intentionally and by design. For all of us, our values come intrinsically from our families of origin, from the household that you grew up in and that I grew up in. They were caught and not taught. They were the culture, they were the feel, they were the unspoken rules. This is how we do it here in our family. Why should we do life that way or why should we do life god's way though as pastor chris shared last week we want our kids to know god to love god and to follow god and we want to do that as followers of him as well he shared from deuteronomy chapter 6 uh, verse 4 through 9. now if you remember that's moses who had just come down from uh, the mountain with the ten commandments from the lord and he was given these to the family of israel and he did that, and he gave them a reminder of, of what those Ten Commandments or rules for living and life were all about. He says in uh, chapter 6, verse 4, These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts, impress them on your children, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates. The principle for us is this, that God wants us to live for Him always, all the time, everywhere, ongoing, every day, through all of our rhythms of life, in all of our relationships. And He wants that because living by God's values are what's best for us. God knew that, and that was His heart intention in creating those Ten Commandments for us to live by. That can be a challenge though, because living by God's values being what's best for us is not always what we choose out of the gate. That same passage in Deuteronomy 6 continues in verse 10, and this is part of the why. When the Lord your God 
brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob to give to you, it will be a land with large flourishing cities that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things. Our Heavenly Father wants good things for us. And as a parent, I know that I've always wanted good things for my kids. Each of you who have a family want the same thing for your kids. One of the challenges though in life is that we all get to choose and as we all have free will within that, and sometimes doing God's best isn't what is our default reaction. In fact, Moses didn't get to enter the promised land. When we come to the end of Deuteronomy, we see that that was part of the consequence because of the uh, children of Israel's rebellion against the rules that God had given them. They grumbled, they complained, they wandered in the desert for 40 years. In fact, at the very end of Deuteronomy, we see that Moses not only doesn't get to end, but someone else does, who his name was Joshua. In fact, we see in, in Joshua, the first few chapters there, one of the, he was one of the most powerful leaders of Israel. He understood how important this was, that piece of designing culture and choosing God's way. In the book of the Bible that contains his life, it was the time of, of the Israel, Israelites wandering through the desert, almost grumbling and complaining of, that they had to do life a certain way. The leadership baton had been passed from Moses to Joshua, and the nation was about to enter the promised land of good things that God intended for his kids. Joshua got the opportunity to deliver his inaugural speech to the whole nation and take a stand of who he would be as a leader and who he would be for leading his home and what the values of his home would look like. It really becomes a declaration of how he will lead the nation of Israel, his own home, and of course, the challenges that we all need to consider for values and culture in our own homes. He says, look with me in Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away God, the, the gods, the little g gods, of your ancestors who worshiped beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt. This is all the time of Moses coming down from uh, the mountain with the Ten Commandments. And serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. That was Joshua's declaration. And the encouragement to us is that living out godly values are God's intention, but it's always our choice. Let me say that again because it's so important. Living out God's values are His intention for us, but it's always our choice. Regardless of your family of origin, your family history can become his story. It can become God's story. God always meets us where we're at, but the benefit to us is that he loves us too much to leave us how he found us. Our story in our home became his story. Both my wife and I did not grow up in Christian homes. Sunday mornings were a time for uh, my family and I growing up, my sister and I, to read the funny papers. It wasn't until high school that I came to a relationship with Jesus through my youth pastor. And I got to see God begin to work in my heart and in my life. In fact, one of the things that I used to do on Sunday mornings when I was a young teenager is sneak out of the house and go for a bike ride. I call it sneaking out of the house because my parents didn't know where I was going. I would sneak over and ride my bike to church. <laughs> when my youth pastor found out about that, he said, Travis, you need to be obedient to your parents and love your father and mother because that's part of the commandments. So I went home and I told my parents and over time, they allowed me the freedom to attend church. Not that they were antagonistic to God, but that was just something that religion wasn't a part of our home. My wife has a similar experience. So when we had kids, we, and we had kids at the age of 20, right after we got married, in fact, we found out we were pregnant with our oldest about five months into marriage. And so we can confidently say that our kids have helped raise us in our marriage. But we knew what we didn't want to do from our families of origin and some of the dysfunctional things, but we also didn't know what we didn't know. Now, all of us have family dysfunction. 
It's a wide continuum of what that looks like. All of us can think of stories of, ah, I don't know that I would parent myself that way, or our kids the same way that we were parented. And because we were so young, our kids got to help raise us. Our knee-jerk reactions to parenting were some of the things that, that we saw modeled that were caught and not taught. There were times when I heard uh, my mom's voice coming out of my mouth or my dad's voice coming out of my mouth. And those reminded me in those moments of, I have a choice right now of how I want to be. Now, my wife and I met in Bible college. That was a very idealistic uh, environment, if you will, of how life should go and the script that you should follow, the commandment and the steps to have a healthy family and family values that reflect Jesus. We tried all that. But that collided with the things that we didn't know as, as well as the families of origin that we grew up in. So we did not do this perfect. In fact, one of the times early on when I was a youth pastor, I came home from work one day. I opened the front door and our son, who's now 21 and he serves in the Air Force, uh, and what a blessing that he gets to do that. He was probably six or seven at the time. He met me at the front door. I looked down at him and he had his little backpack over his shoulder and I said, hey, what are you doing? He said, I'm running away, dad. <laughs> I started laughing and I looked past my son into the kitchen where my wife was and our daughter who had just been born was uh, sitting on the floor crying. <laughs> Mom was, was making dinner or dishes or something like that and she just kind of gave me the look like, I don't know what happened today. So I said, okay, uh, uh, what's in your backpack so he showed me what was in his backpack and he had an xbox controller he had a pair of underwear <laughs> and he had a stuffed animal and at that time we'd been practicing a parenting theory called love and logic so i said okay caleb uh, if you choose to run away you choose not to play xbox <laughs> he slammed his backpack down turned around went back in the house and marched up to his room and i just couldn't help but laugh we weren't perfect by any stretch, and that was us as parents trying to parent three little human beings, but also do that with Christian family values, and at the same time when I was wearing the pastor hat and, and running a youth ministry. So there is no perfect. I only say that to illustrate that it is really the principle of that coming and going, always ongoing all the time. So we had to answer for ourselves, oftentimes in real time, of, of some of those moments of parenting, just how do we create our family values? And that's something that, that we need to consider and focus on, on today. How do we create our family values? For our family, a passage of scripture that really resonated with us, that became a how we do this, that made living out our family values practical was found in Galatians chapter five. It's in the New Testament. And the Apostle Paul writes this letter to us. In fact, in the context that he's writing to, he's writing to a, a group of new believers, first-time Christians, who thought that the formula for living a godly life was the uh, dotting the I's and crossing all the T's of the letter of the law. And in that time frame, the letter of the law was the Ten Commandments that the Israelites were given from Moses. So they thought that that was the best way to live. So what we learned from that passage for us was that there's a life-giving way to do life that's under grace, and then there's a, a legalistic way to do that. And for my wife and I, we found the more we could go with the flow, that really helped us. But if you'd follow along with me, please open your Bible app or your Bible and turn to the book of Galatians, and we're going to read in chapter 5 beginning in verse 13. Follow along with me. Paul writes, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour one each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, 
impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying one another. Our values define our why. So we should ask ourselves, all of us, why does God want us to live this way? One of the reasons I think He does is because the one who knows us best loves us most. This is the best choice for that we would want, not only for our kids, but what God wants for us when uh, we are His children. In our home, for my wife and I, we knew that we wanted our values to be that of love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As followers of Jesus, we know that these should be the values that characterize all of our homes. But what we need to integrate, though, is how do we do this? And this passage tells us exactly how to do this. It says, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. The application for us is that we get to choose. We always have a choice of our attitude, our actions, our responses, what we're going to do next. We have a choice over that. Secondly, says, for the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. That entire law, that's the whole Ten Commandments. That's everything God had written and spoken through Moses and Joshua had affirmed. The entire law, love your neighbor as yourself. So the principle for us is that our job is to live for the good of the other. Treat others the way we want to be treated. The golden rule, it's for the good of the other. So how we applied that in our family was always unique. It could be a conflict that the kids were having. And we would always encourage them. We can't just say, don't be selfish. We had to show them what that looked like and how they modeled that to one another. It means for the good of the other. It means that as the husband and the father, I put my family first. I allow their influence to guide me, not the things that just I want to do because I want to do them. It continues in the same passage, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Here's what this means practically for us. Love means that I treat you like me. That's what real love is, for the good of the other. Joy means we practice fun and gratitude. Life needs to be fun. We're grateful for every opportunity that we get to have, that God provides for us. Peace means that we practice forgiveness. Not that we're peacekeepers, but we're peacemakers. That means admitting when we're wrong and asking for forgiveness. Forbearance means we practice grace. None of us are perfect. In fact, in scripture it says that we should be strong in grace for one another. Because we all get to have a challenging day and we all need a measure of grace from one another. Faithfulness means I am for you. Not only am I with you, but I am for you. I am your cheerleader, I am on your side, and we try to embody that in our family. For just the kids to one another, but also for us, that no matter whether they were in in trouble for a negative choice and had a consequence, whatever that was, I am for you, I am in your corner, just like God is in our corner for each of us individually. Gentleness means strength under control. Now, I personally really had to learn this one when our daughter was born. Boys are one thing. They love to wrestle and jump all around, and you can roughhouse with them. And we did a lot of that in our home when they were little growing up. One of the things I had to learn with my daughter, and my boys had to do this too, is that they had to learn how to use their strength under control, which is what gentleness means, 
and be gentle with her. Meaning, if they ran her over in, in her feelings and emotions, they couldn't treat her the same way they were treating each other as boys. There were times when uh, she would uh, just be a normal girl and begin crying, and my wife would look at me and say, you just need to give her a hug. So gently I had to do that, which was totally different and foreign to me after having two boys and, and doing life one way. I had to do that, and our boys had to learn to do that, to use their strength under control. The last one is, I think, the most important one, self-control. means that I always have a choice. doesn't matter what brother did. doesn't matter what mom did. What matters is that I have a choice and say and control over what I do next in my attitude, being positive or negative, and then in my actions, whether that can be encouraging or not. All of this is only possible because of a relationship with Jesus. You can't be led by the Spirit until you are following Jesus. When Scripture repeats itself, that's something for us to take a clue from, and that's something to really focus in on. So at the end of this passage, it says, walk by the Spirit, led by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, keep in step by the Spirit, by the Spirit. All of us, in our own good intentions, we may desire to do the right thing, but we cannot do it without God's help. That's what my wife and I had to learn, from not growing up in a Christian home, to meeting at Bible college, and trying all the rules and and things that we thought were the right answer. We had to live this out. For us, we found that living our values isn't a formula, it's the fragrance. It is the fruit of the Spirit. Let me ask you, what does your home smell like? We knew we wanted our home to smell like the aroma of Christ and to have all these traits and behaviors and habits that this passage talks about of the fruit of the Spirit so that we could not only just give that to our kids, but we could have the benefits and the blessings of a home that had all of those traits of joy, of hope, of peace, of love. This week in our Life with Rhythm study, that our church, your church is going through, it's going to ask you to identify five family values. It may be something that you can just go to Hobby Lobby and, and pick up a sign, something like this, that just has your family values, and that might be good enough for now. But what my wife and I did is we came up with our own based off of this passage. For us, our family values were fun, because we want our house to be a place of fun and of joy. They were grace, because we all need that. That's part of the one another's in Scripture, that even on our worst day, we're still for one another. Truth, meaning we speak honestly to each other. Clear is kind. We, we aren't deceitful. We practice that regularly, that love. Everything we try to do is to not be selfish, and it's for the good of the other. And hope, meaning that the sun is going to rise tomorrow. Hope is really powerful because that can be the motivator to get through challenging times within life for all of us. So let me ask you, what's God saying to you? What is He asking you to do as you've read through His Word and heard this teaching today? For some of you, it's an encouragement and affirmation of how you are living out your values daily in obedience to Christ and reflecting Him. For others of you, you need God's help to do that because you may need a relationship with Him. That's the only way that we can have any of these by the spirits or being led by the Spirit is through following Jesus. Would you pray with me as we close? God, we need your help to love our families and have values that reflect you because you know us best and you love us most. Would you help us to do that today? Would you continue to encourage us through your word to live a life in rhythm of you? And Lord, for those of us who know you, would you point out the things and the areas and the real practical ways that we can adjust our lives to be in obedience to your word? Lord, for those of you who are watching, those who are uh, listening that don't yet know you, 
Lord, I pray that you would move in their hearts and minds. In fact, if you don't yet know Jesus, would you pray this simple prayer with me? Jesus, I believe in you. I admit that I need you in my life today. I confess my sins to you, and I need your help. Would you be my leader, and would you be my friend? Because I do want to live a life that reflects you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, or if you have uh, a response to that, would you please fill out the Connect card that's either in the link in the chat next to you or just in front of you? We would love to hear about that. The team at Connect Church would love to pray for you and walk alongside you with that. Thank you so much for allowing me to share with you today part of our family and part of how God's truth has impacted our life.